actions okay of a single claim what we did in this work we introduced a novel knowledge based approach that used fact checking reports from multiple sources for claim veracity level assessment it was missing in literature okay in previous work always use generic uh, knowledge basis. Here we have a specific knowledge base based on fact checking reports. We use the ground truth that has been already assessed to avoid to assess some facts that may already exist. Uh, we uh, use a SPO tripods to integrate into the knowledge graph and uh, integrate additional data into it. We develop a visual interface for matching the claims. Uh, this fact uh, knowledge graph may facilitate the work of the fact checkers when integrated into the fact checking process, okay? And uh, especially for avoiding to check something that is uh, as has already been assessed. Uh, in future works, uh, we plan already to include automatic relation verification uh, for the assessment of new claims. And this will be tested at the HKBU fact check service that we have internally at the HKBU. Thank you for your attention. This is all for my presentation. And these are some acknowledgements for the supporting funding. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you. Thank you. As there are a few minutes left, I ask for to the platea if there are some questions. Yes, you have to come back to for, for the question. Yes. Uh, you can hear me, Paolo? Yes. Just a quick question about uh, about the uh, the point where you said that you check your knowledge graph if uh, subject and object are connected or not. Uh, yeah. Do, do you think that the, the, the distance in the knowledge graph between the subject and the object may be used as, a, as an indicator for the, for the strength of the relation or, or, or not? Uh, yes, I think, uh, I think that um, distance can be a factor to be included into the relation verification. Because if uh, there is a direct connection, uh, for sure that fact uh, uh, has been uh, directly assessed. But uh, if they are uh, too far away, subjects and objects uh, into the relation chain, uh, this uh, can be a bit misleading, uh, let's say, uh, or it should be uh, deeply assessed. Okay, but can give an indication to the fact checkers the same if. Uh, uh, that fact succeeds. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo, for for the work, for your work. Again, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Next speaker is uh, Valentino Santucci from uh, that I invite here. Just so you can share the screen. In the meantime, I will present Valentino, who is a researcher from the University of Foreno, Perugia, in Italy. And he will present the, his work about related to a computational measure for the semantic readability of segmented text. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, uh, this is a joint work with also Umberto Bartoccini from Biozanda from my same university and also Paolo Mengoni that you had just a few minutes before uh, from the Hong Kong Baptist University. The outline of this presentation is it's sharing, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. is what you are seeing. Uh, I will start with the goal and motivations of this work. I will show you the level architecture of the system we, we developed. Uh, we will dive into the details of the three different computational phases of the computational system. I show you the experiments uh, and at the end some conclusion and future works. So, uh, first of all, uh, the goal of this work is uh, to define and to implement a procedure for 
computing a readability index of a text. Uh, what we require from this text, we require that the text is linearly segmented, uh, a quite natural requirement because a lot of texts are uh, naturally linearly segmented. Uh, let's imagine uh, uh, literature books that are divided into chapters, so they are linearly segmented. Uh, the other requirement for, uh, for our system is that uh, it should be based uh, only on semantic features. So no grammatical feature, no lexical feature, only semantic information. And uh, the, the, this, uh, this sketch here is uh, what we want to, to devise. We have an input uh, linearly segmented text with different test segments. Uh, we give them an input to our readability algorithm, which it outputs an index between 0 and 1 that gauge the readability of the, of the text in input. Uh, why, why we are doing it? Uh, because uh, nowadays computational approaches to the text readability are a very active research area at the junction between computer science and uh, linguistics. And there are also some practical applications for this. Uh, let's imagine in a word processing software like Microsoft Word, for instance, or uh, just to suggest text to children, uh, uh, reading to children uh, for marketing and political campaigns, uh, to compare the readability of uh, text with the uh, East translated version, uh, to rearrange textbook chapters in the most readable way, and so on. Uh, okay, after the motivation, let's see the level architecture, architecture of our computational uh, procedure, which is divided into three main steps. In the first step, we have, uh, uh, okay, we take in input the, the text, the segments of text, and uh, there is a computational procedure which outputs the, an embedding, a, a vector, a numerical vector for any segment in input. So these numerical vectors are a point in the, in the Cartesian space. This point in the, in the Cartesian space are given an input to the next uh, algorithmic step, the computation of the Hamiltonian paths. In this way, we can, uh, we can have the shortest and the longest path which connect this uh, uh, text vector in the, in the Cartesian space. The final step is a simple mathematical formula which allows to output an index between 0 and 1. So let's now dive into the different uh, phases, uh, the different steps. The first one, segment embeddings. So I uh, remember that the goal is to convert each test segment to a numeric vector. And the idea is to exploit a pre-trained word embedding model, which nowadays uh, there is a large availability of this word embedding model, which are pre-trained on very, very huge corpora. So uh, given a segment, we can compute by means of the pre-trained word embedding model, we can compute, compute the word vector of any word in this uh, segment. Uh, so any, any segment is formed by multiple points, which are the word embedding. We can cluster these points. And after clustering this point in a given number of clusters, we can we can take the centroids of this cluster and concatenate the coordinate of the centroids. So at the end, we will have the, the segment embedding, a vector for any segment. Uh, then we move to the, to the second uh, computational phase, where the goal is to compute the length of the shortest and the longest paths that uh, pass through all the segment vectors. Uh, in order to do this, uh, we measure the distance between the different segment vectors by using, by using the cosine distance, because it's more, uh, usually it's, more, it's known to be more suitable for uh, NLP spaces like the one we are working on. Uh, 
the, the problem of, uh, of computing uh, a path passing through all the points is known in computatorial optimization as the Hamiltonian path problems. And to solve it efficiently, we, we convert this problem to an instance of the well-known traveling salesman problem. So we can exploit the, the, the very efficient TSP solver that are available. Uh, the one we use is Concord, is quite famous in combinatorial optimization. So now a few considerations about these uh, two, two steps. Uh, the segment vectors, uh, I recall, that are built by means of word embedding, with, which are pre-trained of very huge corpora, usually uh, several billions of words, uh, formed by several billions of words. And these uh, text segments are somehow semantically, uh, the, sorry, the text segment, uh, which are semantically related, are expected to have uh, a vectors which are spatia, spatially close in the embedded space. That's the idea. Uh, so uh, following this point, we have that an ordering of these set test segments is an ordering of the vectors in the embedded space. So uh, given an ordering of this segment, the, the length of a path passing through the segments by following the given ordering represents, in some sense, a semantic measure of how difficult it is to read the text by following uh, the, that reading order. That's the idea. Uh, so a consequence of this is that the, the shortest and the longest Hamiltonian paths correspond to the most and the least readable uh, way of reading such uh, segments. So after this consideration, we move to the, to the, to the last step. Uh, the goal of this last step is to compute an index between 0 and 1, which gauge the readability of a given test. Uh, the idea is that uh, the, the segments are uh, indexed by integers in uh, 1 to, to n. Uh, we can represent with the permutation iota from 1 to n the, the, the identity permutation, the original segment ordering. And then we can say that alpha and omega are the ordering corresponding to the shortest and the longest paths, respectively. Uh, at the end of this, we have a simple formula which, which uh, outputs a number between 0 and 1. And this formula uh, practically is the relative position of the length of the given segment with respect to the length of the shortest and longest one. OK. Now, the, the experimentation. We did some preliminary experiment that's not a very sound validation, but something is uh, working correctly, it, uh, it looks. So we selected the seven English uh, literature, literature books uh, from the Gutenberg project just to avoid uh, copyright issues. And uh, these are the books we used, okay? And these are the number of chapters or segments of these books. And uh, then we, we, okay, other algorithmic settings, uh, we use the standard tools uh, like uh, tokenizer for English language from the well-known Jensen Libra library. Uh, for the, the pre-trained uh, word embedding model uh, is the globe, okay, with uh, 100 dimension uh, for any, any token vector. The, the, the key means algorithm used to cluster the word vector just to form a segment vector. Okay, the, the number of cluster we set to 10. So at the end, we have 10 times 100, 1000 is the dimension for the segment vector. Uh, and then there are the other settings here. Let's go to the results of the, the readability of these books. As we can see, the, the most readable of these seven books is The Great Gatsby, 
the, the least re readable are uh, Alice in the Wonderland and the Ulysses of James Joyce, which is well known to be very difficult to read. So the, the, the results are somehow in line with our expectation. Uh, none of these books uh, has a readability index uh, greater than the 53%. So it means that these literature books are not uh, suitable for children, but this is uh, in our expectation. And uh, nothing else. Let, let me move to the uh, slide also. Okay, there are a few problems with the last slide. Okay, okay, you can see maybe this way. It's okay, it's okay. Okay, uh, conclusion. Uh, so, uh, what we did is to define a computational index for gauging the readability, the semantic readability of a linearly segmented text. Uh, the, ind the index uh, exploits the nowadays available uh, word embedding models, which are pre trained of very, very huge for Quora. Uh, the index uh, is computed on a, on a small set of publicly available narrative text. We also use the standard, uh, standard algorithm for, for strong combinatorial optimization. As future works, uh, we intend to, to have an objective validation of the experimental result. We already have some idea. If you want to know, you can ask me later. Uh, we, we would like to introduce other factors in the readability formula, like, for, it, for instance, uh, the difference uh, between the length of the longest and shortest path. Uh, we would like to compute se segment embeddings by exploiting uh, other more modern uh, NLP transform-based models, uh, and also, if possible, to consider other uh, combinatorial problem uh, to, to, to reduce to our problem. So uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Valentino, for presenting this, uh, this work. I just uh, open uh, a question for uh, for the platea. If you have any question from uh, from Valentino, just uh, have the compartir. Okay. Uh, okay. Here. So uh, if there is uh, no no question, I just have one for you, Valentino. Uh, so I see that in, uh, in, the, in this work you tested with very long test. Do you think that the complexity measure, measure can be also used for shorter text or whatever? Uh, maybe it depends on from how long is this text. At the moment, uh, it's not suitable for tweets, for instance, but maybe for paragraphs of a uh, few hundreds of tokens, maybe it should work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Valentino. So, thanks again to Valentino. Interesting, very interesting topic. And then we can pass to the last speaker of, of this morning, which is Nicola Ronzoni. Nicola, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Nicola. Yes, I can hear you. And so, Try to share your screen, Nicola. In the meantime, I will present you. Nicola is a, a PhD student from the Bologna University in Italy. And he will present us today the predictive maintenance experiences on imbalanced data with Bayesian optimization approach. Uh, Nicola, we don't see the screen. Nicola, I think he's disappeared. He, he left? Yes, he left. Yes, it seems so. Maybe he's reconnecting. Okay, <clears throat> waiting until Nicola will be reconnected. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I. So, Nicola, uh, just uh, switch off uh, the screen, uh, the camera. Then you maybe you can. Uh, 
just have more bandwidth. Okay. Um, okay, we can see your screen. Good. And here we are. Can you see full screen? Yes. yes. So, Nicola, I already presented yourself. So, you can, uh, the floor is uh, yours. Please go on. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Alessandro, and welcome everybody uh, to this presentation about uh, predictive maintenance experience on imbalanced data with Bayesian optimization. It's a joint project uh, with uh, the University of Bologna, uh, a consultancy company, Bitbang, and the National Institute of uh, Nuclear Physics. Uh, so let's quick look at the contents. Uh, we, I will define uh, what is uh, predictive maintenance uh, in a general way, and then uh, I will talk about our purpose and research questions. Uh, then I will uh, describe uh, the data sets. Uh, we used the true imbalance data set in this work. Then uh, we, I will look at the methodology, uh, so uh, the machine learning models that we used and uh, our optimization strategy. And finally, some, some results and, and discussions. So uh, what is predictive maintenance? Uh, predictive maintenance can be defined as uh, a, a specialization of condition-based rules that uh, require data from sensors. And these sensors measure uh, variables uh, at different parts of the equipment or uh, the power plants. Um, with predictive maintenance, different uh, aims can be achieved, such that uh, reducing uh, um, the um, risk of missing critical equipment uh, or uh, um, enable just-in-time uh, uh, predictive maintenance. And uh, in this direction, our idea is to uh, detect fault configurations that uh, are connected to various problems. So the aim is to uh, discover a uh, value of the regressors that causes problems in the process. Why this? Uh, uh, to uh, somehow direct the maintenance intervention to a specific part of the equipment and power plant, reducing the cost and then uh, uh, providing some uh, uh, KPI, so some indicators. Um, in our work, uh, um, our assumption is that uh, um, when constructing a, a binary indicator for uh, the status of the process, so a binary indicator that uh, indicates uh, if uh, the process is working or is in a failure state, uh, this indicator depends uh, on all the problems, uh, so all the failure mode that can may occur in the equipment. Furthermore, um, uh, in this analysis, we do not consider time series, despite uh, uh, when uh, uh, observing, analyzing data from sensor, uh, this uh, uh, data register at regular cadence creates a time series. But we, we just use uh, tabular data and uh, we assume uh, independent rows. So our purpose is to um, both classify failure modes, so classify problems, and uh, classify also the machine status, uh, which is a binary indicator, as I said, in a class imbalance tabular data set. And uh, we use so uh, a, a supervised, uh, supervised techniques, and uh, we use uh, four machine learning models, and we try to compare them, uh, and all of them are based on a Bayesian optimization to suggest the best set of uh, hyperparameters. And uh, uh, among all uh, these four, four uh, models, uh, we, um, let's say, put uh, our interest in two classification tasks, as I said. Uh, first, um, discriminating uh, uh, among different failure modes, uh, which is our primary dependent variable. And then with the same setting, so the same hyperparameters that are discovered, on this primary dependent variable, try to um, see how these models uh, perform on uh, the faulty and healthy recognition of the of the of the machine or equipment. Um, at this extent, uh, these are the, our research questions. So, 
can a model whose settings are tuned on a more complex task, primary dependent variable, perform well also on a relative simple task, uh, secondary dependent variable connected to the complex one? And uh, again, among uh, the machine learning models that we are considering, there is uh, a model uh, which performs better than the others in uh, the two use cases that uh, we, we study. So here we are uh, for the description of the first uh, uh, data set, the Sever Imbalance data set is uh, the AI4I 2020 data set. Uh, which uh, simulate uh, real signals from a manufacturing machine, in particular a cutting machine. Um, the data set reports uh, seven regressors, uh, which are both categorical and uh, numerical ones. And uh, on the on the right side of the of the slide, uh, you can see the uh, histogram uh, of the frequencies of the failure type uh, dependent variable. So here we can see that uh, uh, we have several imbalance in the sense that uh, the failure modes are, um, let's say, less frequent by a large amount uh, than the no failure class. And uh, an important aspect in our analysis is that uh, when dealing with the machine status um, task, so the, the binary task, we consider all these four modes uh, aggregated together to, to, let's say, define uh, the machine status. Uh, secondly, the slight imbalance data set. Uh, this data set uh, is uh, a representation of uh, an electrical power system transmission line in which uh, uh, the uh, values of uh, the voltages and the currents are uh, registered for uh, the three phases of uh, uh, the power system. So at the end, we have six aggressors, uh, which are measured at the end at the output of the power system. And um, again, here on the, on the right side, uh, we report the uh, frequencies of uh, the, the failure class for our primary dependent variable. And in this case, instead, the uh, failure modes are uh, somehow in the same order of magnitude of the no failure class. Moreover, when uh, uh, consider aggregated these failure modes in the uh, electrical status, uh, the, the, the final class will become, let's say, more frequent than the no failure class. And uh, just a, a remark for both of the, of the data set uh, problems, so failure modes uh, may uh, depend or just uh, um, uh, on a single regressor or multiple regressors, so multiple conditions. So here, uh, an overview of our uh, optimization strategy and uh, how we mm, somehow um, represent our methodology. So uh, data comes from uh, the manufacturing machine or the electrical power system transmission lines are divided in two sets, so train set and test set. And we use uh, the train set to decide the best set of uh, hyperparameters uh, for each model. And then uh, based on this set of hyperparameters, we deploy the model on, on, uh, on unseen data, on the test data. For what concerns the optimization, uh, uh, we can see that uh, the Bayesian optimization is a, a an informed search, so uh, it doesn't uh, try all possible combination in the hyperparameter space, uh, but uh, thanks to the acquisition function, tries to expect uh, regions in the hyperparameter space where we are getting good results rather than, uh, le uh, let's say, um, explore all the entire region. And uh, how is based this optimization is based on a bias rule so uh, the aim is to estimate uh, a posterior distribution for uh, the objective function that we want to maximize given uh, the data and uh, the hyperparameters. And then once uh, the um, posterior um, uh, is estimated, the acquisition function uh, indicates uh, which is the next set of hyperparameters to be evaluated. Here, a simple toy example of uh, a 1D Gaussian process. 
that uh, somehow represent uh, in a in a simple way what uh, is is done by the acquisition function and uh, the uh, uh, um, uh, estimation of the posterior distribution so uh, the aim again is to consider uh, a gaussian process that uh, uh, somehow is used to um, estimate the posterior distribution of the objective function and then try to look at the region in which we are getting good results thanks to this acquisition function that in our case is the upper confidence bound. Um, for what concerns the machine learning models that we use in this uh, experiment, uh, we focused on uh, four machine learning models, three ensemble learning models, uh, the adaptive boosting, uh, the gradient boosting and random forest, and one neural network, which is, uh, um, let's say that uh, it's a, a small neural network with just one hidden layer. Um, for all, uh, uh, let's say, models, uh, we use the macro average of recall score per class of the failure type uh, of our primary dependent variable has uh, uh, objective function to be maximized in the, in the Bayesian optimization. And uh, uh, we set the number iter of iteration for each model to 25. And uh, we use a five-fold cross-validation in the train set to uh, let's say validate our uh, search in the in the transcend, and then we deploy the model on the thirty three percent of the data set. Um, here are some results from the first data set, the sever imbalanced one. Uh, we report here two histograms uh, with uh, uh, some well known metrics for imbalanced uh, imbalanced data set, uh, and uh, of course. Uh, our objective function. Um, so uh, for both tasks, uh, we can say that uh, the multilayer perceptron, so the neural network doesn't outperform the uh, tree ensemble um, learning models. Um, so uh, basically we observe that, that uh, when dealing with uh, uh, severing balance uh, um, data set uh, in which uh, um, the classes uh, uh, have a few observation, uh, the neural network is not superior than other models in both uh, situations. So in both uh, uh, machine status and failure type, which are our uh, secondary dependent variable and primary dependent variable. Uh, instead, when looking at the result from the electrical power system transmission line, so this light imbalance data set, here uh, we have that the neural network outperform other models in the um, in the primary dependent variable, so in the failure type. While for the electrical status, so the secondary dependent variable, all uh, um, all models uh, uh, perform uh, pretty well, even because, uh, as I said before, when we uh, look at uh, the um, a construction of the indicator for the electrical status and we aggregate together the failure modes, uh, the, basically the, the, the class uh, will become uh, um, more frequent than the no failure one. So this is why all models perform very well. Uh, finally, um, we, uh, we provide a, a pipeline, we provide, a, 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 um, let's say, um, a pipeline, yes, a set of models that uh, can be tuned by a Bayesian optimization. And this uh, Bayesian optimization uh, is proved to be reliable uh, for, uh, let's say, perform two uh, classification tasks uh, 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 to, to deal with uh, first a multi class problem, so our primary dependent variable uh, to classify failure modes. And then with the same settings uh, suggested by the Bayesian optimization, uh, we also, um, let's say, inspect uh, uh, performances for the secondary dependent variable, which is instead a binary classification. And uh, this methodology shows good generalization properties for these two kind of uh, uh, tasks. Uh, finally, uh, there is no uh, uh, a models that uh, outperform the other on both data set, on both uh, uh, use cases, sever imbalance and uh, slight imbalance data set. 
but instead we we observe that uh, the neural network is superior when uh, uh, we are dealing with uh, uh, slight imbalanced data set and uh, instead ensemble learning are uh, uh, um, um, are good when uh, we are dealing instead with a slight, uh, uh, a severe imbalance data set. And uh, yes, this is uh, the end. So thank you uh, here at the acknowledgement and thank you for uh, uh, attending this presentation. Of course, if you have questions, uh, uh, I'm happy to reply. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nicola, for, for your presentation. Oh, keep it the slide, keep it the slide, please. Keep yeah, slide. sorry. Uh, I just open the question for, uh, okay, there is one question, please. Uh, hi, Nicola, thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, just a quick question. From the point of view of the computing resources that you need to train and run your models, are they trivial or do you need the special hardware and special computing resources? I suspect that it depends on the data set, but for instance, on the data set that you considered in your use case. Uh, so um, it's quite fast for both uh, data sets. Uh, we don't use uh, any special uh, machine for, for that, just uh, run, uh, run the old code in the local. And uh, this is uh, obviously uh, did because uh, uh, somehow the, the, the data set is not so, uh, so big. Uh, in fact, uh, we have more or less both uh, uh, 10,000 data points. So that's, uh, I think, uh, why it's quite fast. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Other question to, to Nicola? Actually, I have one, Nicola. So you, you presented this work uh, based on the Bayesian optimization to, to uh, Use it to solve the, the problem. Are you planning to use uh, in in your activity and your uh, let's say studies uh, other uh, optimization methods and maybe then compare the results? Uh, or and if yes, which one? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, um, let's say that uh, we try to uh, construct uh, versatile pipelines that can be used in different contexts. And maybe in future work, uh, uh, it would be interesting to compare the result of this Bayesian optimization uh, with respect to other um, somehow brute search like uh, grid search or uh, other advanced uh, methods. Yeah, it could be uh, of interest, of course. Okay, Nicola, thank you. So, so uh, we are uh, at the end uh, of this uh, first uh, session. We will uh, start the next session at uh, 10 minutes to, to three today. Uh, will the chair will be, uh, the session will be chaired by Daniele Giussini, which is a colleague of mine. And uh, before to close, uh, let me thank you uh for let me thanks all the speakers for their valuable uh, valuable uh, works uh, and for the time they spent to be to be here today and to present their their activity and evolution of the of their activity this is quite uh, quite important for also for the evolution itself and for the sustainability itself of the of the AI and the workshop in also in the next future uh, let me thank also the platea who assist uh, the, the meeting today and uh, see you at uh, 10 minutes to, to 3 today for the second session. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. We are back at uh, 3 p.m. We will reconvene at 3. Are you here? Yeah. yeah. Yes.
Thank you. 